I will introduce myself, as always. I am Jim Gustafson, professor of psychiatry at the University of Wisconsin Medical School, giving my 22nd out of 36 lectures. Today's lecture is called The Forces in Being Taken Advantage of. All our patients, including ourselves. Almost always, the education of the patient and the education of the doctor is explicit. That is all foreground and little or no background. What is made explicit as is, is reality. What is implicit is still arising and is not reality. In other words, reality or being consists of things like furniture in the foreground explicitly. Reality as flow arising in the background implicitly has no reality for patients and doctors or the entire Western population. This is our so-called progress. Now, a single situation with all our patients. This, if you will, metaphysical situation we are in in relation to our assumptions about being or reality pertains not only to the patient we discussed last week, courting, rather all of our patients, all of our population are in it. We are in it. This brings about an astounding finding all day long in the clinic, all this morning in the clinic, which is seen to some extent by doctors, but has a absolutely no mention in our science. I put it squarely in, your, in the foreground for you and I make it totally explicit, namely, all of the patients are running straight into perverse situations in which they will be badly taken advantage of. They assume a mutual or symmetrical exchange between equals, and they get a perverse and grossly asymmetrical situation. All, every single one. This is what makes them ill. Now for Gustafson's exclusion principle. The great problem I'm posing for this lecture, is why do all the patients fail to read accurately when and where they are walking into highly perverse situations to the advantage of the other party, to the detriment of themselves? If we do not understand the mechanism of this disorientation, we will be worse than useless in attempting to repair it. A great instrument of orientation we have, potentially, but it's no better than its calibration. So, the remainder of this lecture will, will explain the miscalibration that is endemic in the entire population. The simplest way to explain it is by my exclusion principle. To borrow Georbrand's language, here's the first version. Grouping order excludes symmetry order. In other words, in Jorben's language, uh, which was addressed to cosmology, it fits exactly what's going on in our domain. If you see from the point of view of the group, you will lose the capacity to see from the, view, the point of view of yourself. This is exactly what Gilligan discovered in her series with 10 to 15 year old girls on the way to becoming 15. As they increasingly got caught up in anxiety about their standing with the teen pack, they increasingly did not know their own opinions. Each year, the number of I don't know replies doubled. Interesting. High school and college and professional training only makes it worse, which she didn't say, for boys equally. So you get a population from bus drivers to doctors who know the right answers to the examination. That is how they qualify, and that is how they get, that is how they keep a position in this mega machine we all work for. Of course, there are billions of us capable of reckoning the symmetry or mutuality of exchange that is called making love. We discussed that last week. Two million years of evolution of this capacity is not going to go away altogether. In general, this results in the opposite exclusion. Symmetry order between equals excludes grouping order. A belief in symmetry or mutuality of exchange excludes seeing the asymmetrical 
or perverse exchanges that are at hand, as we discussed last week. So Ed, now we'll go to the diagram. Essentially, our entire problem of being taken advantage of lies in this diagram in the two opposite ways that it comes about. When you're on the right side, you cannot see the left side. When you're on the left side, you cannot see the right side. Now, we'll come back Ed, to, to me now, and, and, then, and then we'll go back to the whiteboard, and I'll tell you what those words mean. But first, let me say a few things to introduce it. To use Jung's term, the mind or instrument of orientation the conscious mind tends to be one-sided. That is the diagnosis of what goes wrong in the calibration of the instrument. Tate called it isolated will, either scientific or romantic. Very few, he thought, are capable of seeing the whole situation, or in other words, the left and the right side simultaneously. What it takes is what Bateson called double description. The eye depends upon it precisely and physiologically. The left and right eyes see from slightly different angles, which allows depth perception. It is as if the population sees with one eye only, like that or like that. So now let's go back to the whiteboard, and I'll make this very specific for you. So uh, let's look at the right side is the so-called grouping order there. And in the grouping order, uh, one People bunch things with the, with the eye of the grouping order. For example, as in a psychiatric, every time I'm on call with the residents at night, this is what happens. You, you get an explicit program of questions for whatever the problem, you know. I, I know all the questions they're going to tell me they know the answer to about someone who's suicidal. So the explicit, it's what the group has agreed is the order of things to do, and it will follow that order. And, and, and the result will be that the implicit darkness that is the suicide will not be gotten. In other words, I have to say to the resident, uh, what was in the mind of the patient uh, when she decided to hang herself? Well, I don't know. It wasn't on the list, right? So it was, uh, you know, I always say you did a perfect job, except you missed the main thing. You missed what was implicit, but the patient never made it exp explicit, which is at w for two years she's chronically suicidal, and then all of a sudden something has drastically cha changed that wasn't there before, which is she put a noose around her neck. And you don't know what's in her mind, and you didn't ask. Well, you see what I mean by seeing with one eye, the programmatic eye, very dangerous. Or uh, the reverse, uh, if you go to the left side, the symmetry order, um, what you get um, is like what we talked about last week when, when, when couples become a couple. Um, people courting, they become the whole world. Not the, whole, the rest of the world does not exist, and they cannot see over the horizon to the right side when each will be pulled apart into all these separate worlds of family, work, childcare, friends, and everything else. Of course, this is the problem of single explicit descriptions, of seeing with one eye only. Now, those who there are people that are capable of seeing with two eyes, such as some of Gilligan's girls, could see both the left and right hand side of the diagram. They could be ready for the harsh situations of being excluded on the right. And they could also be open to mutual and very, you know, those sweet situations when, when girls can be kind to each other and, and treat each other with respect, right? And they knew which was which, so they know the, knew the whole situation. Okay, let's come back from the whiteboard. All right, we're heading into the conclusion here. Now, I want to say a little, one remarkable thing which will set up the case that we're going to talk about. This is called the noble playing field of the Bronze Age. It is extremely interesting to me that the Bronze Age discovered the noble playing field. The rules make the game symmetrical between equals. Symmetrical means what's here is the same, it's the same on both sides. The rules apply to the same. The play is to put the opponent into an asymmetrical situation, which is clumsy, while retaining a symmetrical position in oneself. That is, Shots that throw him off balance accomplish its advantage, but you have to be careful not to be thrown off balance 
yourself. That's the game. The Bronze Age comes between the Ice Age, which is mostly symmetrical relationships, and the Modern Age, which is mostly cruel asymmetry of empire. Or if you ever want to watch, just watch a debate on television. It plays with the conditions that are emerging in sports and in the arts and everything beautiful and yet daring. I see the playing field of psychotherapy in exactly this light. And here comes the case, the case of the daughter's difficult talk with her mother. Several years of work with the resident and myself had brought this patient to the point of relying on herself, especially with the help of her excellent dream instrument. Like all of the children of the Garden Island, she had learned to go out the back door of a very abusive family situation to get the backing she needs for herself. In other words, she was in the right compartment of, of asymmetry in her own family with a mother who forgot her. And so she went out the back door and got in, into, the, into, the, into relationships of symmetry. What had been especially terrible for her after her father died when she was 11 was that her mother could never acknowledge her daughter's vulnerability in a daycare situation with a neighbor in which she was sexually abused. Indeed, the mother kept sending her back into it. In other words, the mother was in the right-hand compartment and didn't see her daughter. Yet our patient did not want to give up on relating to her daughter now that she's grown up. She wanted to talk to her again to get her to acknowledge what had happened. Yet she hesitated. Why? Because she feared she might get the acknowledgement from her mother. She got it once. Her mother at once admitted that something had been seriously missed. But then she feared her mother would resume business as usual about denying it from then on. And so the pain would, would be set up again, you see. So I said to her, I think you're right to hesitate. Because one new loop of acknowledgement is altogether likely to disappear in a hundred old loops of denial. You would need to be prepared to say a second time to your mother, I need you to acknowledge it again and not deny it, and so forth. She thought she'd, she'd think about it. Now, here we have again the exclusion principle at work. The mother had suddenly become a single parent with the death of her husband who needed to work and to take care of the children all by herself. She regrouped, so to speak, by a cheerful position of an ad or attitude of denial of difficulty. What was lost by this attitude was its opposite of being present to the daughter's being harmed. What the daughter needs in this asymmetrical situation is a very symmetrical attitude such as now she admits it, now she denies it. There is a certain play to that attitude, which is ready to take her mother either way. Thank you.